So in this video, we're going to continue with exploratory research and look at another area called ethnographic research or ethnography. The idea behind ethnography is to really immerse yourself in the culture of the consumer. It's not just to have some sort of cursory understanding of them, either by some observation or through some survey design, but rather to live the life of your consumer and understand them much more deeply. Now, ethnography comes to us from anthropology, and to conduct it, you really need to be a trained ethnographer or anthropologist. This isn't some easy thing that anyone can just do one day and all of a sudden observe people and get something meaningful out of it. You need to have the skill set to actually go in and deeply investigate a particular consumer culture or subculture. And again, what you're really trying to do is get deeply into the lives of those consumers. So one really famous example is the company Harley-Davidson. Now, let's start with some simple truths. Uh, Harley-Davidson makes super fun motorcycles that are actually terrible and overpriced. If you look at objective metrics, they are more expensive than their foreign competitors, they are less reliable, but boy do they sell a lot of bikes, and boy are they popular, at least in the United States. And so it's fair to ask, well, why is that? Why is it that Harley is able to command such a price premium for a product that's relatively low quality? And a lot of it will come down to the marketing strategy that they've taken. Harley-Davidson understands that if they want to sell motorcycles, they have to deeply understand who their consumers are. And to do that, they actually regularly go on rides with their customers. Now, they do this in a casual way by having senior level executives actually go on these rides regularly so they can get a feel for who their consumers are. But much more to the point here, they actually hire ethnographers and there have been ethnographic studies of their consumers. And these ethnographers will go on these multi-day overnight motorcycle rides and try to really understand who their consumers are. And I'll give you a couple of examples from some of the ethnographic work so you get a flavor of what this looks like. On one particular ride, ethnographers noticed that Harley-Davidson riders Upon pulling into a motel for the night, they would actually get extra towels. Take a moment to think about why that might be. Well, if you guess that the reason is that they're buffing up all the chrome on their bikes, you'd be right. Harley-Davidson customers treat their bikes like precious icons. These aren't just some passive things that they possess. These are sacrosanct possessions that they have. They treat them like they're idols. They treat them like they're part of their extended family. They're very seriously committed to them, and the slightest little bit of dust is something that they want to get rid of right away. So that's a really interesting observation, not really one that you'd pick up on if you just asked, let's say, a survey of Harley-Davidson riders. You need to actually go and live the life of these riders to understand who they are and what's important to them. Uh, another observation is, roughly in this culture, if you touch someone else's motorcycle without permission, there's a good chance you're getting punched in the face. There's a belief that the possession, this motorcycle, is so special and so unique to the rider that it shouldn't ever be defiled by someone else touching it. It is almost like it's a holy object of some sort. And so you might be asking yourself, well, what do you do with this information? Well, the first thing you do is you recognize that quality is not the dimension where Harley-Davidson riders are really trying to optimize on. If that were the case, they'd be buying foreign competitors. Instead, it's this culture around Harley-Davidson that really drives their sales. You could see that in some of their advertising, right? If you look at a few of these ads that I'll show you, these are not ads highlighting quality. These are ads highlighting the lifestyle and talking about how special it is to have a Harley Davidson. It has nothing to do with the durability of the bike or the price point of the bike. That's not even displayed in advertising. Instead, they really focus all of their attention on the culture. Another idea you can have is, well, if you know that Harley Davidson riders are, are worried about somebody messing up their motorcycle, imagine a situation like this. When you pull into a service center, Instead of pulling in your bike somewhere where you can't see it anymore, what if it was pulled into a much more open space where you can see what's going on with your motorcycle and feel much more comfortable about somebody else servicing it and perhaps linger a little bit longer in the store that adjoins most of these service centers, buying accessories like leather jackets or additional parts for the motorcycle, or maybe even scoping out the next motorcycle to purchase. By understanding that consumers interact with their motorcycles in this very deep way, Harley Davidson's able to sell what turns out to be low quality overpriced product, and they do it quite well. And of course, Holly Davidson's not alone. Here's a philosophy statement from Procter & Gamble and just highlighting a piece of it. At p g the CEO is not the boss, the consumer is. In other words, if you can understand who the consumer is, in other words, if you can understand who your consumer is, you can sell better to them. And so one example of how another type of ethnography can go is instead of having someone trained follow people, you can have people wear things like Google Glass or something like a heads-up recording device as they interact with their product. The idea being is you want to see how they interact in their natural environment. I'm going to show you one example here, and, and pay careful attention to how this unfolds. I'm going to try these Supermax now and see how that... I wanted to try this and see how comfortable these are. See if we can find how to open these without just destroying them. They don't have... Let's see. 
they don't have the, uh, I don't know if they don't have the instructions on how to, the others have the perforated lines on it. I noticed that with these, that you just open. I don't know if you just pull these or what. But I don't see anything perforated here that I can open this with. Either that or I'm just overlooking it. Well, we'll just, we'll just open a little corner here. Now, if I were the brand manager for this product, I would immediately take pause at whether the packaging design actually makes sense or not. Now, I wouldn't go and retool my entire factory line and production line just because of this one person. I would use this as a moment to then go understand more about my consumers and ask the questions of whether this packaging design is particularly difficult or not. I wouldn't have even known to ask that question, though, had I not done this type of ethnographic work. So thinking about advantages and disadvantages, on the advantages side, like some of the other exploratory work, you do have very rich data, right? It's people in their natural environments interacting with products. That's fantastic. You, unlike observational research, do have the ability to dig into specific things, right? If you have a question, you can follow up with someone that you're conducting an ethnography with. And again, you do have this vivid information for managers where this might not be the best quantitative data to support an idea, but it certainly is evocative when you could show videos of people interacting. Think about that video that we saw of that woman working with that packaging. Boy, would that be a compelling case to make along with good quantitative data. On the disadvantage side, you do have small limited sample sizes, right? This is not going to be representative of all consumers, but rather just the ones you're able to actually study. You will rarely have quantitative data. And then there's this other thing called the Hawthorne effect, which is the idea that when people are observed, they change their behavior. So if you know that someone is studying you, you might not behave the way you always would. And I'll dig into the Hawthorne effect a little bit later, but again, the idea is if you know you're being observed, that might not be the natural way that you'd interact with an environment. Now, this is almost like a trade-off between observational research and ethnographic research. Observational research, you don't get to dig in, but it's people behaving the way they would normally. Whereas ethnographic work is you do get to dig in, you do get to follow up. On the other hand, people might actually be behaving in a way that is different from what would happen if no one was standing in the room watching. So ethnographic research can really help us understand consumers in a deep, fundamental way, though the limitations that I mentioned do apply. Next, we're going to shift gears and we're going to talk about focus groups, perhaps the most common form of marketing research that exists. We'll see maybe that it shouldn't be, though.